Now, chapter four. Chapter four, you got a picture of the rapture. And it's as if John is being carried forward in time to see the rapture of the church. In Revelation 4, 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So right here, a door is opened, and someone goes up. In Revelation 19, a door opens, and someone comes down. And John hears a voice here that sounds like a trumpet. And if you uh, look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the great chapter about the rapture of the church, it says, For the Lord himself shut us in from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, right here you have, in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4, with the trump of God. And in Revelation 4, 1, John hears a voice that's like a trumpet. He says, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So what's going on is John has been carried forward in time. And he's seeing the rapture take place as if he's in it. And he is seeing the saints meet the Lord in the air. Now, John is a part of the church. He's in Christ. So, uh, at the when the rapture does take place, his body is going to come up from the ground and the his soul is going to come with Jesus and his soul is going to meet his body and he's going to get a new body. But right here, uh, he is being carried forward in time to see it so that he can write about it. And remember how I showed you that when John is in the Spirit, he's being carried somewhere else. And could be to another time period entirely that he's being carried to. Because look at Revelation 4.2. Revelation 4.2, notice the phrase again. He says, and immediately I was, here's the phrase, in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. So he's in the spirit. He's being, uh, he was carried somewhere else, just like he did back there in Revelation chapter 1. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was, took forward in time, saw some things that haven't happened yet. And Revelation 17, he's carried in the spirit, took forward in time, seen some things that haven't taken place yet. And now that's what's going on here. He says in verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he that was to look upon like a jasper, and he that set was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. So the devil, you know, he used to be around the throne, right? And what would he have seen? He would have seen a rainbow round about the throne. And he loves to use the rainbow and make it a perverted symbol today. He loves to take the things of God and twist it and, and pervert it. And notice also how Hollywood doesn't have an original thought because it says, uh, I saw there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And, he's, and it's got that rainbow round about the throne. Well, you know the what they call the classic Hollywood movie, Wizard of Oz. What does the character sing? Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. There's a land I once heard of, once in a lullaby. You know, well, that's heaven. You got a rainbow up there. It's way up high. Notice the movies that are considered classics aren't even original. The Bible had it all before those movies even came out. And where does she go in the movie? She goes to the Emerald City. What does it say? It's it's like in verse 3, it says, In sight like unto an emerald. Well, that's where Dorothy goes, the Emerald City. She goes to the Emerald City, and the Lord's throne is said to be in sight like unto an emerald. And there is a gold street up there and a lion up there. You got the lion of the tribe of Judah sitting on the throne up there. 
What do you have in that Wizard of Oz movie? You got a lion, only he's the cowardly lion. But that's not what he is in the Bible. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's fearless. And the righteous are bold as a lion. And in the tribulation, what do you have? You're going to have iron men. In pl and not a tin man, but you're going to have some iron men. And the false prophet will cause the image of the beast to speak. Remember that? If you've read Revelation 13, the false prophet will cause the image of the beast to speak. Kind of like giving him a brain, you'd say. Just like in that Wizard of Oz movie, there's a character that needs a brain. Uh, there's going to be a witch killed in the tribulation. And there is all throughout the Bible. There will be a witch killed in the tribulation, Mystery Babylon, who has deceived people with her witchcrafts. And when the Lord touches down at the second coming, not the rapture, but the second coming, the revelation, it's going to involve a whirlwind. And he will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So if he's, he's got his sandals on, they will be like those ruby red slippers. And they aren't worthy to stoop down and unloose his shoe latchets. They'll bite the dust. So you see how that entire movie is very unoriginal, even though it's a classic. They never had an original thought. The Bible had it all before that even came out. It says in Psalm 58, 10, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. He's going to have his ruby red shoes on. There will be no escape. The Lord's army will get you or will get you and your little dog too, as she said in that movie. Nobody will escape. Joel 2, 3 says, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Revelation 4, 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. What John's seeing, what John's seeing here could be the judgment seat of Christ. So he's been trans, transported forward in time. Remember that he's been transferred forward in time beyond 2022. And he sees these elders clothed in white raiment, and they have crowns of gold. So perhaps the judgment seat of Christ has taken place. And I'm just speculating. That may not be what's going on. I'm just I'm speculating. So they're sitting clothed in white raiment. And when, when Jesus healed that maniac, he was sitting clothed and in his right mind. You see, Jesus leaves people sitting down because he's got all the work done. He finished the work, and now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. When you when you come in contact with Jesus. In a sense, you sit down because all the work's done. You don't do anything else. Jesus done did all the work for you. Now, obviously, we're supposed to get up and work down here. And we earn, earn rewards and stuff that way. But when it comes to our salvation and our place in heaven, we can sit down. The work is done. Jesus leaves people sitting down because he's done all the work. He finished the work. Now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And these elders have crowns of gold. And these have to be incorruptible crowns. A lot better than anything that they would ever get down here on earth. Where people are fighting over corruptible crowns. And corruptible trophies. And corruptible gold medals. And corruptible uh, statuses in the society. And corruptible places in the history books. In Revelation 4, 6, it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So there is a sea of glass above your head, and there is a body of water up there above the second heaven, and the top of it is frozen. And Job talks about it. In Job 37, 18, he says, Hast thou with them spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten-looking glass? So what you have is a body of water above the second heaven, that is outer space, and the, you know, the second heaven, what people refer to as outer space, and the top of that body of water that's above the second heaven is frozen, and it's a sea of glass, and that's where you have 
the throne of God sitting on top of that. And the Bible shows you in Psalm 148 and verse 4 that there is waters above the second heaven. It says, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Plural. And Job 38, 30, The waters are hid as with the stone. The face of the deep is frozen. There's a top of that sea of glass. And it's frozen. Elsa couldn't even survive up there. You hit, you had you got to have a glorified body to survive up there. You got to be an angelic like being or be a a soul of a saint to make it up there. In Revelation four seven, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And I believe this is describing the seraphim, and a lot of Bible believers make it the cherubim. And I wouldn't argue either way, but here's why I believe this is the seraphim here and not the cherubim. I believe, obviously, they're similar, but I, here's why I believe it's the seraphim. Look at verse 8. And the four beasts, which ha had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Since the beasts have six wings... That seems to be the seraphim. And most call these four beasts cherubim. And I wouldn't argue with you about it. But this really seems to match Isaiah 6. Where it talks about those seraphim. And Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So it's got, a, it's got them six wings in Isaiah 6, matching the seraphim. And Re uh, Revelation 4, it's got them as, with six wings matching Isaiah 6, which is the seraphim. And in both places, they're saying, Holy, holy, holy. Now, I know, obviously... Everybody in heaven is going to be saying holy, holy, holy. But by using the same words there in the Bible, it seems like it's making that connection there, matching Isaiah 6. I wouldn't argue with you either way, but that's what it seems to be showing you, that this is the seraphim it's talking about, giving you further description of them. And in Revelation 4, 8 through 11, it says, And when those, four, when those, when those beasts... Give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sit on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So this is the meaning of life. This is the purpose of life. This is why you are here. You see, God wants everyone to get saved and give Him glory. And we're created to give Him pleasure. And most people just give Him heartache. But that's why you're here. You need to give God pleasure. Now, chapter 5. In chapter 5, heaven rejoices because when nobody up there was worthy to open the book, Jesus is. In Revelation 5, 9, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. And to open the seals thereof. See, they sing a new song. Down here, they can't come up with a new song. They can't come up with a new, uh, new chords on the guitar. It always sounds like another song. They can't come up with new lyrics. The lyrics always sound similar to another song. They can't come up with a new chorus. The chorus always sounds similar to another song. And the, the, the contemporary Christian music... They're pretty much just, um, they hear a, a secular song and they copy that song and make it into contemporary. So it's like you'll hear a contemporary Christian song and you're like, wow, that, that sounds just like this secular song that I heard. You see, there's no new thing under the sun. They can't come up with an original thought, but in heaven you got a new song. 
And it says, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and nation and people and out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So the Lamb's worthy to take the book and to open it. That's the Lord Jesus. And if all the saints and everyone up there wasn't worthy to open the book, if only Jesus is worthy to open the book, that tells us that Jesus is still superior to everyone in the future as well. And we might have glorified bodies like him at that time, but he's still king of kings. And he's still the almighty. He's still the only one truly worthy. Revelation 5.10 And hast made us and our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It says. So we're going to reign on the earth. It says in 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And that's denying us the reign. You see, you might be the lowest on the totem pole at your job right now. But if you suffer for the Lord, you're going to reign as a king in a glorified body one day. Revelation 5.11 And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. So ten thousand times ten thousand is a hundred million. And then you got thousands of thousands after that. And that's just making an innumerable company of angels. That makes up to be an innumerable company of angels and heavenly creatures. Now, chapter 6. What you got in chapter 6 is the first account of the tribulation. Now, notice how perfect the order is. In chapters 1 through 3, you had heavy talk about the church, picturing the church age. Chapter 4, you had the rapture, which puts the end to the church age. Chapter 5, you got some, some stuff that reminds you of the judgment seat of Christ. And now chapter 6, you got the first account of the tribulation. Notice how the book of Revelation is showing you a picture of the order of the end times events, of God's end times calendar. So in chapter 6, you've got the first account of the tribulation. Remember how I told you there's more than one account of the tribulation. Some people just have two. Some people just have it going chrono in chronological order, going all the way through and showing you just one that it shows just one account of the tribulation and if you want to believe that that's fine some people they got it that there's two accounts they got it stopping in uh, revelation chapter 12 and then starting all over again in chapter 13 some people have it where there's four accounts to me personally and i'm going to show you as we go through this i believe that the book of revelation is showing you five accounts five five road trips through the tribulation period. And I'll show you that as we go along. But what I, what I believe you have in chapter 6 is the first account of the tribulation. And you have the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to open the seals. And this will take you through the first account of the tribulation. And what you have been seeing, what you've seen going through this is John being taken forward in time. Seeing things that haven't taken place yet. And when the Lamb opens the seal, it's sim simply showing John something that's going to take place. Every time the Lamb opens a seal, it's showing John something that's going to take place. Revelation 6, 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Notice it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. So John is going to see as well as hear. And the first thing, he, first thing he sees, seal number one, a white horse rider, and this would be the Antichrist. It says in Revelation 6, 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. It's not Jesus Christ. It's the Antichrist. Jesus Christ comes back with a sword. This guy comes back with a bow. This guy is given a crown. Jesus Christ comes with many crowns. So you see the distinction. This guy comes on a white horse at the beginning of the tribulation, while the Lord comes back on a white horse at the end. Revelation 6, 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. 
So the second seal, you got a red horse rider, and it's war. In Revelation 6, 4, it says, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that set thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So this is war here. See, the Antichrist is going to come in peaceably, but war is still going to be used against those who won't comply with a one-world government, with a one-world religion, with a one-world monetary system. There's going to be some people that rebel against that still. So this is going to be a bloody time. Even though he's pretending to come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, there's going to be some people who... He'll have people brainwashed into thinking, well, they're going against peace. So there's still going to have to be some bloodshed to get rid of those rebels, as he would probably call them. And in uh, the next seal, you got a black horse, and that's famine. Revelation 6, 5, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and, be and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, a balance is like for weighing food. And I, I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. There's going to be so much famine that people are going to resort to cannibalism. It's going to be a horrible time. And the fourth seal, you're going to see a pale horse. Death and hell will be unleashed. Revelation 6, 7 through 8. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now notice death and hell are personified. They are capitalized. And there is an actual creature called death. And it seems he's bringing up the inhabitants of hell with him to kill the inhabitants of the earth. In the horror movies, they're not going to have anything on this. Uh, why do you think the zombie movies are so popular? Have you ever seen a movie where monsters or some type of creepy crawling critters break loose in the streets? That's just a very small snippet of the tribulation. Now the fifth seal, you got the martyrs. Revelation 6, 9, when he had opened the fifth seal. You see, the Lamb's just opening these seals, and each time he opens a seal, it's just showing John something that's going to take place in the tribulation. When he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. There will still be people who care enough about the word of God to die for it. And some, something else to think about is even during the tribulation, God doesn't lose his word. It doesn't get lost in the commotion. And even though there will be a famine in the land of hearing the word of the Lord, there's still going to be some saints out there who's going to hear it and hold on to their testimony until they die a martyr's death. And it says in verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They're praying for the second coming. How long will it be until the Lord comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God? So not even the martyrs know the exact time of his coming. But it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So it says they wear a white robe. So a soul can wear a white robe. The soul is shaped like a body. Now, you've got the second coming. When he opens the sixth seal, it's showing John the second coming. It simply shows John the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld him when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now notice how that matches the second coming in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 29 through 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the, cl come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice how that matches. Revelation 6.13 And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The stars fall, just like in Matthew 24. 
And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. You see how that matches? They're not so tough now. When they see Jesus Christ coming back and flaming fire, taking vengeance and mowing down the enemies of God, they hit the trail and said to the mountains, the people were going to say, to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? You see that? This is the first account of the tribulation. Every time the Lamb opens one of the seals, it's just showing John something that takes place in the tribulation. And with these seals, the first six seals here takes you through the first account of the tribulation. Notice it says the great day of his wrath is come. That's the day of the Lord. That's the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Chapter 6 took you through the first account of the trib. The lamb is opening the seals. And when he opens a seal, it just shows John something in the future. And there's still another seal left. But first you have a commercial break that brings you into chapter 7.